This is Bumping Into, where we have interesting conversations with people from all walks of life. Welcome to Bumping Into, I'm Francis Populin, and on this episode of the show, we'll be diving into the controversial subject of electromagnetic fields, or EMF, and their potential effects on human health. We'll discuss common health issues that might not be going away on their own or those that can't be clearly diagnosed and the potential that it might be due to home or workplace EMF. We'll also examine the ABC Tawong Cancer Cluster, a case that has garnered significant attention and debate in Australia and beyond. EMF is a type of energy that is emitted from electronic devices such as mobile phones, Wi-Fi routers, power lines and electrical switchboards. While EMF is a part of the environment we can't escape, some researchers have raised concerns about the possible health effects of exposure to high levels of EMF. The World Health Organization has classified EMF as a possible carcinogen, which has led to intense debates among experts and the public alike. In the early 2000s, the ABC Tawong Studio Cancer Cluster emerged as a major health concern in Australia. The case involved a cluster of breast cancer cases among staff at the Brisbane-based studios. Some people have suggested that exposure to the EMF from the transmission tower on the site was responsible for the cluster, while others have disputed this claim and some suggesting that it may have actually been mold toxins. In this episode, we'll be speaking with an expert in the field of EMF research and discussing the potential health effects. We'll also explore the ABC to one cancer cluster and examine the evidence that's been put forward to explain the cluster. We'll speak about the missed opportunities of doing deeper research that may have led to finding the actual cause before the building was suddenly demolished. My guest is retired researcher Don Maish. So sit back as once again we delve into this complex and controversial topic. Thanks very much for for making the time to come on the show, and thank you very much for all that information that you've sent across. Um, there's there's a lot to that, and there's actually probably a few podcasts in, in itself there in some of that um, that information across various topics there, especially that uh, article that you wrote in the corporate ties that um, that bind. That's right. Yeah, that yeah, chapter. It, yes. Yeah, that chapter is fascinating, and that in itself the the layers of. Uh, into webs of connection amongst decisions that are getting made and things that aren't getting looked at. Oh, one of the one of the early reports I did, I call it fields of conflict. And that's very much what it is. Absolutely, I think a lot of people would be surprised. You know, it's you often look at things like this, and you'd like to think that they're that it's a coincidence that maybe this person was connected at a past job, or maybe this person's husband, just maybe. Um, mm-hmm. But then when you start seeing lines and lines come together here um, of people and places and past things and future things, and it's, it's, a, it's a bit more than a coincidence. And it's a little bit worrying. Um, but Sometimes I, I say it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a symptom of a good business practice, depends on which way you look at it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what side of the fence you're on, isn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. Um, but I mean, look, that's fascinating, and we'll we'll talk about that as well. But um, and I know that the the primary subject we're going to cross on is your involvement with the ABC Tuong Studios um, and the the breast cancer cluster there from from a mm-hmm. few years ago. But before we start, let let's just go back. Um, I suppose your interest in the field, um, how you got into it. Let's, I, I'm, you know, it's an interesting story there in itself. So let's talk about the beginning of what brought you into, because well, what do you find yourself as? Is it an EMF consultant? And what would be the title there that you would? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, maybe retired researcher <laughs> at my age. So I'm right. still writing, still writing things, just finishing off an article right here myself. But oh, um, okay. I think my, My interest in this basically arose around conflict of interest. I started out, um, I originally had a job. I was working in Boston, Massachusetts for the nuclear power industry and design, you know, designing nuclear power plants, you know, which sounds pretty interesting, but yeah, boring work actually. But, um, I started working there thinking, well, look, if these things were safe, there wouldn't be any problem. I couldn't see any problem in it. 
but working there for a couple of years, I did see design errors, and I, I saw that uh, safety very much was secondary to um, profits. And yeah, um, common after two years working, I was rather disillusioned, and I thought, well, I don't really want to continue this anymore. because. Uh, um, so I had a chance to come to Australia for an engineering job. So I took I took that up since I have relatives in Australia. I took that up and um, came to Australia. You know, got off the plane and I went to the company that offered to give me a job. And they said, "Oh, I'm sorry, we've had a building slump on, and um, we can't really give you a job at the moment, but we can offer you a position in our office in Auckland, New Zealand." The bearing mind, I'm an American, just off the plane. I thought, where in the hell's New Zealand? <laughs> <You> know, <it's... laughs> so I had a chance. And I thought, well, look, I just got here. Uh, I've got relatives in um, in you know Melbourne, and um, so I stayed there. I got a different job working in an engineering office. And uh, many years later, I um, was moved to Tasmania because I met a Tasmanian lady. She dragged me down here. Oh. And um, I got, got to know Senator Robert Bell, who was an Australian Democrat senator. And one day he asked me that they were doing um, inquiry, in East Link inquiry, which is looking at a high voltage transmission line, I think from Queensland to New South Wales. And he just wanted to know, were there any health issues that may be involved in this? And so... Um, I started doing a bit of work for, you know, the Australian Democrats and looking at this, this power line. And uh, Wallace discovered that the exposure standards that were supposed to say this technology was safe were totally inadequate. To, to give you an example that um, there's evidence now that um, a level looking at magnetic fields from power lines uh a level of two milligauss is connected with adverse health effects. A level of twelve milligauss has been repeatedly found to be connected with, you know, a risk factor for breast cancer. Okay. But the standards at the time in Australia were like for residences, residential areas was a thousand milligauss and for work the workplace five thousand. And they were only meant to address immediate biological damage to high levels of exposure. Wow. So I wrote this report just pointing this out and saying that we did not really have adequate standards. This was tabled in the Senate in the early 90s, and I thought, well, that's going to be the end of it. No one's going to comment on this. But it wasn't the case because I criticized the um, the international, so-called international body, International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation and Protection that set these standards, which Australia was following. And... Um, they one of the authors of that uh, standard wrote back and said my my report was extremely unscientific and uh, really tried to tear it to pieces. So I read these reviews, his review, and thought, well, this is interesting because what he says is um, not quite accurate. So I wrote another Senate paper called Right of Reply, replying to these various criticisms, mainly from the international. You know, scientists who wrote the standards. And um, that was tabled in the Senate, and um, he never replied to that. So at the time, this uh, Senator Bell's office started getting some inquiries and uh, a few uh, leaked papers, like one of which was showing that um, a workers' compensation case in Melbourne in 1991-92. And it was interesting because this was like there was sent the entire report from the Workers' Compensation Commission there. And what that was, uh, was actually a very interesting study, which very few people know about, is that the in this one office building, that the uh, office worker and her uh, secretary started working there, and they noticed a nice big office and no one was in it. They probably should have worked out why no one was there, but they moved in there. They're, they're there for about 18 months. And over that period of time, their health deteriorated. And um, basically chronic fatigue syndrome. So they're tired all the time and uh, catching colds and flus, anything that was about, they seemed to catch it. And uh, they they put that down to their um, just, you know, office place, you know, heavy workload. 
uh, until I think it was December 1991, um, they decided to put computers in the office. And the computer, the, the screens were distorted so much they couldn't get them to work. They called in a technician and found out their office place, the, the office room they were in, was located uh, directly above a major electrical substation for three office buildings. And all the electrical cables, pretty massive cables, are running along the ceiling and uh, right underneath where they are working. So they're effectively sitting inside a, a substation that's been dressed up with an office space. Well, directly above it, yeah, you know, ground floor substation, first floor. Here we are, we're working. They, um, the office manager, then put in a work a claim for um, their just for the you know workplace claim just for the medical expenses because the uh, the doctor who was involved in the study said, look, this is probably the cause of your condition, uh, especially because. Because when they found this out, they moved into another area of the building that had away from the substation, and their health improved. So they put a workers' compensation claim in, and uh, so the workers' board decided, well, let's see who used to work in this room. So they looked, they they found four former employees who worked in there. Every one of them were suffering from chronic fatigue syndromes syndrome when they were working in there, mainly extent intense fatigue and catching colds and flus. And uh, when they moved out of the, those, that area, they got better. So um, what was interesting about this, so they had a problem. You know, this is a very sick office. Mm. And what the building owners did, which is fantastic, they said, okay, we're going to fix this. They moved everybody out of the office, and that was reconfigured as a storage area library where no one would be working in there for long periods of time. So it's chronic, long time chronic exposure that seemed to be the issue, and then they spent quite a few thousand shielding floor from the substation below, and having the electricity company reconfigure the substation to reduce the magnetic fields, and I think the fields were in off order of about eighty or ninety milligauss order of a magnetic field, and um, so that problem was fixed and. Uh, no one died from it, and it was a very important uh, situation, I think, because they found a problem, and they addressed it and fixed it, not like which happened in other situations in Australia, which is fairly common. That That is, you're right, and that's surprising as you're telling that, that uh, you're expecting to hear it go the other way, not, not the way that it actually went. Yeah, well, the difference is, if I may maybe upset some people, is that if we look at another situation, ABC Tuong, do you want to go into that? Yeah, now? let's go in, Let's go into Tuong, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that was one where um, a number of ladies, I think it was 11 or 12 eventually, developed breast cancer while working in the building. Uh, and that was, looked in, epidemiologists looked at this and, and thought it was like definitely there was a cancer cluster, breast cancer cluster in that building. So the big question then is, is why? You know, was it something in the building? Or was it just a chance finding? But it, they, an experts, expert panel was set up to look at this. And what happened then, which was I think was a great shame, was that the trade union representing the rights of the workers started saying publicly, if anything is found in this building that is causing this breast cancer cases, we're going to mount a, a massive class action. So right away for the expert committee looking into this, it's like, oh, God, you know, um, this is going to be a bit of a problem. If we, if we find something, the ABC is going to be up for possibly millions. You know, it's like yeah. it's like opening up a Pandora's box. Yeah, they really shouldn't have said anything. They should have played it quite low key until – until it run its course and then sort of snuck in from behind. Yeah, they should have said, look, this is a, 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 an important case. Let's see if there's a factor in this building. Because what would happen then you say, well, this is probably a factor in other buildings too. Let's find out what's going on. Mm. So um, the concern mainly was, I think, the radio towers and the building, which I couldn't see to be an issue. So, I was working with some colleagues at Massey University, and we actually put in a report on this, and we suggested that what should happen is that the looking at the 
magnetic fields, the, the you know the wiring within the building, able runs and that sort of thing, substations. You should actually look at each of these eleven cases. Uh, we should look what what each case what these ladies were exposed to. And one lady uh, actually said that she wanted to know what was coming out of the electrical cabling that was running up right alongside her her desk. That was never done. And uh, all they did was um, wire somebody up with a uh, monitor and just uh, just walk around the building during the course of the day, not looking any particular areas, which wasn't really the proper thing to do. And so we we wrote this report. We said, this is what you have to do, what you should be looking at. This may be an issue. Uh, we had no reply from the expert committee, so I actually rang up the chairman and said, have you received our um, you know, submission? Yes. Uh, are you interested in following up any of our suggestions? No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> that was no, we're not. That's sort of the end of it, you know? And so months, sometime later, the ABC, the building was closed down. Everyone moved out. The equipment was moved out. And I think the building was demolished. So, yeah. Well, we never really know what the situation was in there. See, the difference between this and, and the earlier case was that in the earlier case the, in Melbourne, the building owners wanted to know what was happening and fix it. Yeah. It seemed to be, in this case, uh, there is more of concern that, this is just my opinion now, more of a concern that, well, look, God, if we find anything in here, if we make a connection, um this may be a major legal class mm. action. Um, maybe they didn't want to go there. I'm not going to say, but uh, it was a shame because you never really found out what was actually going on there. Because there was arguments as to when they actually did do the, they started their investigations. The building was mainly decommissioned by then. They started their investigation. Uh, now the building was still, still in operation. Right. Okay. We still had, you know, the electromagnetic environment in there. They took they took radio frequency readings and couldn't find anything of note. Yeah, the building was still going, but in my opinion, and opinion of the fellows who I was working with at Massey University, in New Zealand, is that it wasn't done properly. Yeah. Well, especially when one of the ladies, as you said, she requested to find out what the exposure was where she was sitting because there was an electrical cable tray running right past her desk. Yeah. Which, you yeah. know, to me, that would have sort of been the, the first place you'd run in and test. That would have been obvious, but it was it was never done. That's the crazy thing about it. So, so big when, question mark with the ABC too long. Yeah, and unfortunately it will always remain that now. I mean, the, the report that they, that they did, apart from not testing – um, particular areas that were requested. Obviously, it showed nothing at all to raise an eyebrow. Oh, they, I think the report they did, uh, they said they, they couldn't, well, basically, it could not find any factor in the building that could positively be identified yeah. with a causative factor for breast cancer. Now, if they had found, like, for instance, a 12 milligauss magnetic field, is a number of studies have shown this is connected with increased risk of breast cancer. Now, we're just surmising now, like if a study had been done looking at the people's exposure in the building, the levels that they have been actually been exposed to during the day, these 11 or so ladies, and let's say if, if the levels that they found were in 12 milligauss or more, you've got a legal case. Yeah, You've got a Pandora's box. Now, the thing is, there's uh, the too long building, I don't think it's really unique in any way. Because, like, I saw one building in Melbourne, they had uh, very high fields, an older building, you know, office building, very high fields running around the building. Um, but no study was done as far as health effects. It was just, you know, I noticed that this is a fairly common problem. Uh, I did do a survey down here in a government building after, sometime after that. And, uh, found the levels throughout the building very low. Um, you know, no problems except in one area. There is a communications room, um, a lot of equipment in there, and there's a cable run that was running out going through the wall. In that 
particular very narrow area there is fairly high magnetic fields uh and there was two desk vacant desk sitting there and i just suggested to the the person i was dealing with it's probably a good idea not to have those desks there you know if anybody's uses those desks moving further away and what was interesting the desks were occupied, but not at the time. Both people were off with chronic fatigue syndrome symptoms. Oh, oh wow. I said, well, yeah, well, interesting. So yeah. um, I started doing some stuff with the Australian College of Nutritional Environmental Medicine. Some of the doctors there are looking at people who were being treated for chronic fatigue, and we started to see um, a possible connection. So... Uh, there again, with people at Massey, we put together a hypothesis paper suggesting that uh, prolonged exposure to you know, power frequency magnetic fields may be a cofactor in chronic fatigue syndrome. That's not saying it's causing it. What it is saying is that if a person is suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome, which is sort of very unknown, it's largely a bit of a question mark, what's going on here? Yep. And they have an additional exposure to magnetic fields for a long period of time, that may make their recovery worse, maybe a cofactor in the condition. So that was published in the journal um, so sort of early 90s, and that was actually followed up with funding to do a clinical study. About 49 people were being treated with chronic fatigue. And what was interesting, out of the 49, I think it was 13 people had exposures over – our benchmark figure, which was two milligas. So over the period of about a year, what we did was we identified, we measured the magnetic fields in the homes of all these people because they they weren't working, they were sick, they were home. And we identified of the high exposures, we identified where they were coming from, like meter box by the bedhead, that sort of thing, transformer by the bedhead. And, and we eliminated those exposures and follow those people for, you know, a mere period of six months or more. And, of course, I was expecting, like, well, hmm, what's going to happen here? Are we going to see an improvement in health? Initially, we saw the people got worse. Oh, the people yeah. were re- reduced to magnetic field exposures. I thought, well, that's rather disappointing. Um, and then what happened, like, a few months afterwards, and then they recovered. It's like they initially got worse for some reason, and then they had a rebound, the symptoms largely disappeared, and they stayed that way. So that was sort of an interesting finding. Like, okay, well, why did they initially get worse and then get better? Yeah, that is not interesting. Quite, is it, not quite it, sure. It, Maybe something to do, because what the difference was, was that their exposure to these magnetic fields at night were removed. Maybe it took a time for the immune system to readjust. I don't know. But yeah. uh, there's a lot of interesting cases mm. like that. Like one of the cases we had, I think it was in Elwood. This is a, another study in relation to breast cancer. But the fields in the house were fairly high. So we worked out where they're coming from and an um, electrician came in and fixed the problem. Most of the times you can fix the problem when you identify it. What was interesting that her son was he's in the early 20s. He said uh, afterwards, he said it was interesting because he had, he suffered from severe itching, like eczema. And at night he had to put gloves on because he just would itch all the time. And uh, he said, more or less after the electrical problem was fixed, his itch- itching went away. It seemed to be fairly consistent that the exposure to power frequency magnetic fields, may, especially at night, for some people, certainly has a biological effect. What's very frustrating is that, you know, we're looking at levels under 100 milligauss. Then you look at the standard, which at the, at the time was saying, oh, a thousand is safe. Well, that's, um, that's what I can't get my head around. So we're, so you, you're sort of saying two milligauss is, is you, you want to be there or under in exposure, but the standard yeah, no. is saying a thousand. The standard says a thousand. And what was interesting, Australian Radiation Laboratory, in response to one of my writings, was saying that I I failed to understand that the standard was only addressing immediate 
health effects, like a shocking, you know. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Really high levels of exposure. So it's protecting you against really high levels of exposure, immediate damage. Yeah. A shocking, but literally it's a shocking standard. Uh, but it did not, it was not intended to be used for prolonged low level exposures. So what good is the standard? It, set by industry to make sure everybody's happy that there's no litigation. What was interesting that in the early, I think it was the 90s, um, there was a government committee of scientists in America who looked at power frequency magnetic fields. And they looked at all the possible biological effects and they recommended there should be phased in a two living, two milligauss exposure limit is phased in over time with further research. And that report was actually done by scientists. All the people on the committee agreed that this was an issue, but it sort of disappeared until it was leaked to a U.S. publication called Microwave News. And they published a lot of the extracts from that. And it seemed to be what the issue was, is that if the port had been released, it was like, Again, the Pandora's box of litigation. Be a lot of situations where people are exposed over that, and um, it could be legally an issue. So it was. It wasn't. It wasn't released. It was suppressed until it was leaked. And, and then, yeah. and then the, the response from the industry was that, well, you can't quote from this study because it, this this report could just only a draft. It was a draft report even though all the scientists who were involved in it agreed this was an issue. So, oh, you can't quote from that. You can't even refer to it because it wasn't, it was never approved. Right. So, but the scientists were showing it there as a problem. With the standard, is ours different to America? Because when I've tried to do a bit of research, it seems the, the American standard is, is pretty close to what you're saying, that you want to be under three. Um but then it looks like the Australian standard, as you're saying, is astronomically higher. So is there differences from country to country about whose agreements on what exposure is too high? The, yeah, there is a, there is um, a certain amount of, uh, amount of flexibility there. Like, for instance, in the UK, a uh, government study found that um, a level of four milligas was consistently connected with an increased risk of childhood leukemia. Oh, and four, wow. but see the problem is is that um, right during the early days, I think the industry realized there could be a problem here. So uh, the standards were devised that looked at only looked at immediate health effects. You know, like I say, a shocking standard. Yeah, and uh, that the International Commission on Non Ionizing Radiation Protection, I call it IRCNUP, uh It's a select committee by invitation only. Now, it's sort of interesting to note that all the people on this committee <laughs> have a track record of saying that there's not a problem. Yeah, so it's a closed closed shop. If, closed you, if you agree, yeah, they, you, they, you can be one of us. Yeah, I think they're like gatekeepers, I think especially maybe. Yeah. Um, keep the level so high that um, there will never be a problem with litigation. Now, Australia at the moment doesn't really – the Australian standard used to be uh, residential exposures, 1,000 milliamps for offices, 5,000. Yeah. At the moment, Australia doesn't really have a standard. And wow. I was at one meeting where uh, it was it was a radio frequency meeting I was involved in, uh, Standard Australia. And I asked at the beginning, uh, we're looking at, the whole meeting is looking at radio frequency fields. Why aren't we considering the whole the whole power power industry fields? And they, the, the chairman basically said, well, look, there's a, a bit of a can of, can of worms, that one. Uh, there's a lot of evidence showing that there could be issues. So we're not really looking at that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's too hard right now. We'll talk and about it later. And they, try, they tried to get a standard in Australia, but um, it turned out, it was basically put in a too hard basket. There's so much evidence just showing there can be an issue that they decided, well, look, we're not going to look at this. We're just going to go follow the international standard, which is sent by industry. And that's been the situation ever since. And that's why uh, <clears throat> back in the um, early 90s, 
I was actually doing a fair amount of writing about these issues. And I had a chance, I was offered a position um, at Wollongong University uh, looking at the standards, the PhD study program. And that took about five years to do. And I called that the procrastinating approach, you know, setting standards for ready for exposures. Now, I call it the procrastinating approach because Procrustus was one of these ancient Greek robber villain. And, uh, you know, uh, and he was like, had a house by this road, you know, all just, you know, make believe sort of stuff. And uh, people walked past his house. He, they, he'd invite them in for a cup of tea or whatever they had there. And he'd get them to lay down in his bed. <clears throat> now, once he did that, they were trapped. If their legs and arms were too big for the bed, he would chop them off. So they conform to this restriction, you know, conform to the bed. If they were too short, he put them on a strack stretcher and stretch them out till they fit, you know, the bed. And this thing came to me referring to a standard that strict adherence to is followed. Um, so a progression approach is one where a standard is set that you have to follow stri a strict point of view and other points of view will not be looked at. Yeah. yeah. And um, I saw this uh, when I was invited, I was, the um, Standards Australia had a committee which was looking at radio frequency standards. At the time, Australia had a fairly strict radio frequency standard, um, and but they, the industry needed wanted to change that. So we had the Standards Australia had a committee called the TE Seven Committee, which was looking at possibly increasing the Australian standard to meet the international one. We're talking about radio frequency now, not power frequency. Okay. And uh, so the, um, the CSR representative on the committee said, well, we should have people here, at least a couple of people here, representing the con consumer of the public viewpoint on these issues. So uh, that was, it was connect selected that the Consumers Federation of Australia, which only existed to point, appoint people to these committees, uh, was given the role of of getting two people to join the committee representing the Australian Consumers Federation. And uh, John Lincoln was one person, I was the other person. And so we were able to get on this committee. And so what was in, I was on it, I think for about two years before it wound up. And so the committee basically was discussing the science behind radio frequency exposures whether the standard was adequate enough to cover all this. But what was interesting too, I started to see, you know, a lot of submissions being put into the committee that were highlighting problems, like the standards were basically too high. Here's the evidence for low level exposures. What was interesting is that the, the majority of members on this committee are either government or industry, uh, which is one block. And all these submissions, some of them very scientific, well put, if they were saying that there was a problem, they were more or less dismissed. Yeah, you know, it's like old Procustius in his bed. You know, the arms are too long. They chop them off. No, this is no good. So they are dismissed. But then papers that were put in supporting the standard, the increasing levels, were just accepted. Conformance. Yeah, so it was like, uh, that's why I called it my thesis question approach, because this is what was happening. Anything which was not in, in, in conformity, conformity with what the industry wanted. Now, what's interesting in the committee meetings, it was further on, it was said that, well, Telstra representative said this, is that, you know, there's new technology coming online, radio frequencies, you know, uh, equipment, that the emissions were in excess of the Australia, the old Australian standard. And um, so what was needed, if we want to keep track with technology, we need to increase our standard to allow this equipment to come in. Therefore, let's increase the exposure levels. And uh, which didn't really seem to be a very good scientific way of doing it. No, that's a commercial mindset, not a, yeah. not a health and safety one. Yeah. And actually it reminded me of something else that, um, 
it was like what happened, slightly diverging here, after Chernobyl, uh, Finland had a problem because it was exporting reindeer meat. And the reindeer meat was in excess of the allowable radi- you know, uh-huh. uh, radiation exposure <laughs> limits. And they tried to sort of think, well, what we should do, mate, if we just increase these limits to such a point where the radiation in the meat is lower than the limit, therefore it's safe and we can sell it. They didn't get away with it, but it was an example of what can actually happen behind yeah. the scenes. That's that's scary, isn't it? That really is very scary that you think that people smarter than you have your back, that they're doing research and governments are double checking, cross checking, triple checking. And if this guy, mm-hmm. this guy bought this guy a box of chocolates, that means it could be possible corruption. So get him off the board. You, you would like to think that that's happening. What, what I've actually seen in relation to some scientists who are uh, involved in this whole issue that if you consistently say that there's not a problem, there's no research that shows that there's a problem, you tend to get promoted, you tend to be invited to walk on a, you know, the red carpet. Because well, you're not a troublemaker. Jobs, international committees, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, because but you're making you're saying, it easy. It's easy for everyone. Yeah, if you're saying that there's a problem, well, I get it. You know, <laughs> it's getting yeah. rather hard to get a job. Yeah, and that's been the situation all along, and that, we're getting into a situation now where we're getting to new technology. A lot of the new technology, radio frequency technology, is um, can in certain situations can have very high exposures, and um, we really don't have any, in my opinion, you know, proper exposure standards that address prolonged low level exposure. So that is this been the uh, occurring problem all along. Because I'm curious, I, I want to go a, a bit deep into the to the technical side of it. So mm-hmm. a, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here, uh, I know we've touched on the RF side, but more around the ABC and and the Tawong Studio. That's that's the electrical magnetic fields that are coming from things like switchboards and high voltage power lines. That's right. Yeah. That's that's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So is that in terminology wise, is that what you refer to as a, a an ELF field or is that still EMF? Yeah. E- ELF would be extremely low frequency, which would basically be, you know, 50 hertz power frequency used in Australia Right, would okay. be part of that. Okay. Whereas then you get into radio frequency, which is the much higher fields. So if you got right. two, two areas there. And if we talk about, um, and this may be a hard question for you to answer, but let's say typical uh, office building. We've got a, an office building. It's two or three stories. You've got a switchboard, you know, with a switchboard cupboard or a pl- small plant room on every level mm. as you walk down the hall. As is it? Is it? Well, I know that a lot of these buildings tend to have um, thermal scans done once a year, once every two years to to ensure mm. that there's nothing running too hot on the switchboard. I'm going to take a wild guess here that no one is turning up to check for the EMF that's coming off these switchboards. No, that's true. There's, there's no, there's very little um, acknowledgement of that being an issue. Um, and is that something that, I mean, is there a, if we said in a typical scenario um, of this office building, would you say that that switchboard could be pumping out more than it should, or is it, you know, I know it's hard without nicely defined mm-hmm. guidelines to work with, but in terms of um, if you're about to rent a space in an office and you come up with your equipment, would you be suspect on, would you be walking past going, well, I'm going to check that these switchboards aren't pumping out more than they should be. Is that something that should be being looked at? Yeah, actually we uh, did a paper on that for the, uh, the journal of the Royal Australian Institute of Architects. BD, BDP Design Digest, looking at these issues and basically saying the problem is very easily addressed in the design phase. So if you're building an office building, you want to make sure that your substations, your electrical switch boxes are well away from where people are going to be working for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but the problem is look, another case, which a nurse sent to me, I won't say which, say which hospital in Australia it is, but sent me a photo and concerned about it. There was um, 
sick children's ward, immediately below it, it was built immediately above the electrical substation for the entire complex. Yeah. And that was because the built designers had no idea. You know, it's it's a matter of ignorance. I'm sure yeah. that no one's thinking about this. And people turn up to work and they spend at least eight and often quite a lot more hours a day sitting in an office that may have a switchboard on the other side of that room. And mm. you're oblivious to what could be going on. Is it is it something that can occur with age? Is it a case of much like a thermal scan that these checks that, that, you know, you should be checking because that can be pushing higher limits as cabling ages? No, it's basically design area. That, that there's a, there's another issue which uh, I'm finding, well, it's well known within homes now, is that um, when you have um, in older buildings, you can get a situation where you got, say, you're, you got metallic water pipes, copper or steel, iron, running around the building going out to the main. These, what, these water pipes need to be connected to the neutral side of the main switch for electrical safety. And that means, so, so if there's ever a situation where a wire breaks loose and touches a water pipe, that water pipe won't, won't be electrified and shock people. Yeah. But quite often run into a situation, which we did here in, in Hobart, where in older buildings you can get... Um, a situation there in electrical wiring, your uh, electricity comes in, active line, and then goes out on the neutral line. So what can happen there is that uh, when you get corrosion happening, uh, and that neutral line is also connected to the um, metal water piping for electrical safety, um, whereas you can get... um, part of the return electrical current returning back to the substation from the building runs along your water pipe. And when you get a situation like that, which is fairly common, it was very common. I've seen that down here. I've seen it in Sydney, for instance, and many places it's very common that you can get corrosion, internal corrosion in the water pipe. You get electrolysis. If it's, if it's a plastic pipe, no issue, but if it's, it's an older home, building you can get electrolysis internally in the water pipes which will leak gradually corrode and release heavy metals into the water and uh, it's only a couple of years ago we had an off- uh, older building here in in Hobart <clears throat> that the people who worked in there kicked up a fuss because they had the water tested and it was contaminated with heavy metal and it's well what's going on here and um, it turned out to be is that um, electrical problem. We had a school here, a special needs school, which uh, they found that there was a cancer cluster in the, in the building, and there was a big transmission line right by, and a major electrical substation right underneath the building. And um, it was the situation was so bad that. Every time they off, even the school was closed for a few days, they'd come back, they'd turn the water types on, and the water would be black, and they have to let oh, the water run wow. just from corrosion, old pipes corrosion. And uh, they had to close, they had a little swimming, swimming pool, which they had to close because people were getting electrical shocks when they're getting in the water, you know, a little tingling. Wow. So it major, major, major electrical problem. It was an older building, an old wiring. Jeez. And uh, the issue turned out not to be from the transmission line, but it was from um, just electrical currents running along the water pipes, which shouldn't happen, which is easy fixable. That was the problem. And months afterwards, uh, the building was closed up, people moved out, and um, I was asked to go in there just to see whether there was still a problem. The were actually quite low. The, the power line, transmission line, wasn't the issue. And I thought, hmm, interesting with the water, you know. So it was it was closed up for a couple of months. So I turned the water tap on. It ran clear. No corrosion. It tasted fine. So it was like they didn't have to replace the pipes. But it, by eliminating that electrical problem, it eliminated a possible you know, heavy metal poisoning. Yeah. So that gets into another issue, not looking at <clears throat> magnetic fields, you know, it, but 
just what can happen with your water pipes. And we did a study in Melbourne. We found that was actually a fairly common problem, which is fairly easily fixable just by putting it in your, if you've got metal water pipes, you put a short plastic isolator in, a uh, plastic water pipe in, which blocks the return electrical current running on the pipe. No more problems. There again, it's a fairly simple solution, but it's, you know, people, most people don't realize this can be an issue. Because that was going to be my next question is then from be it the homeowner, the office building, um, what do people do? What do they, what do, you, do they, is there consultants that come out, EMF consultants that can come out and, and audit a site and, and check? There and... are, there are various consultants which, which do come out. I think it's an issue which, uh, needs to be looked at more often that at the present moment it's not really being looked at is there is there any products that as a person can can buy plug in use to help mask some of those those dangers just another issue yeah um there's a whole world of gadgets that you can buy that says provides protection yeah and um you, know, you plug them into your wall, you put it around your you know your neck and it you know, provides protection. They don't work. No. The only solution is uh finding out if there's an ex- excessive exposure in your home or workplace and then working out ways of eliminating it. And most of the time it's really easy. So I guess the first step is you've got to detect it. You've got to be aware of it. And probably more so too if you have some sort of health issue, a quirky issue that maybe doesn't go away that people can't explain it's probably the first thing to go looking for maybe that's the thing if, if you've got a chronic condition it just doesn't seem to go away this is what we solve people having chronic fatigue syndrome is that um in some cases this may be an issue of course it's important not to say it causes it causes an illness but when it if you got an illness and this is also present in your say your house it may be a contributing factor, making things worse. Definitely something you, I guess you're going to have to be aware of um, because you can't, you know, as we've discussed, you can't rely on a standard or a protocol, you, anyone else doing it for you. You can't assume because it's just, it's obviously, it's just not there. We're not at that point. It's difficult. Who do you trust? Yeah. Who do you trust? Yeah. And it's interesting in your, your document, uh, your report that you wrote there for the, the, um, <clears throat> on chapter 16 in the corporate ties that bind, mm-hmm. there was a bit where you actually mentioned, and it, it, it grabbed me because it implied that, um, so yeah, the CSIRO, which is a government institution as such, mm-hmm. and a lot of people place a lot of trust in it. I mean, you know, that they, they buy the, the diet cookbook. They, they believe if they've, if, mm-hmm. if they've tested it, if they've looked at it, um, that it's a source of reliable information. It most times CSIRO is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Except in that one particular instance. Yeah. Which well, was uh... the, the bit that you wrote, which I would encourage people to go reading because it's, it's, it's something you've got to read, I suppose, to, to absorb it all is um, the situation in where the lead up to, I guess, where they, where you mentioned that they were finding things that were making making the government uncomfortable. So they started stripping them of the role to look at the, you know, the, the standards, EMF exposure and all the rest Mm -hmm. of it. Um, So that's quite interesting is you've got a a department for the government that says there might be something here. And then all of a sudden the government of the time says, well, you don't have to look at that anymore. We're going to take that bit away from you. Yeah. That was the uh, division of radio physics. It was the lead off. It was Stan Barnett. Um, and they were given the job of looking at standards, research into radio frequency exposures, because at the time all this new equipment's coming on, you know, is there an issue? And the CSR report looked at it and basically said that, well, look, there's a lot of research here, but we can't really say this, a lot of the technology is safe because these, this is the sort of research we need to do. And they laid out a whole research program. Now, I, I knew the, the the lead author on this, and what had happened is that he was called, after this was done, it was classified confidential, not to be released. He was called in, because the message, he told me this, and he's I think he's since moved to Britain somewhere else, but the, uh, that 
he was asked to, um, they're a bit concerned about the abstract. You know, this is everybody reads the abstract, doesn't read, but by reading everything else. Yeah. And the abstract was saying, well, we can't really say the technology is safe. This is because we have to continue. We need to do more research. And they wanted people who wrote it to say, let's just change that slightly to say that, well, we don't really have evidence that the technology is unsafe, but this is some research we could do. Yeah, you know, a minor little thing. Yeah. That, uh, and they refused. And of course, what, and this, you know, under the Howard government, so it's probably understandable. The department was disbanded and they were told, this organization will no longer look into these issues, health effects, radio frequency, that sort of stuff. And um, it goes into further about, you know, people being fired and, you know, other people being hired who were saying that there's no problem. So that 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 report is actually it's all available online. I've got it on my website. If anybody really wanted to read it, yeah. So Stan Barnett, who was um, senior researcher, he was let go, and uh, the report was sort of just buried confidential until um, we knew who did it. But one of the people involved in it leaked the paper. He sent a copy to uh, some of the report to the Australian Democrat Senator Robert Bell. And also to the magazine, I think Communications Weekly, uh, Stuart Fist, who was an investigative reporter. Then we requested a copy under Freedom of Information for this report. And it was sent to us. And Stuart Fist, the reporter, got it too. And then, of course, the, it was out there now. Um, and, of course, the first copy we got was all LV page was stamped confidential. <laughs> and sub- subsequent ones were sent to us. With not out, no about that sort of on it, so uh, but basically it showed that even an organization like the CSR at the time, you know, I mean, this, this was a you know different political era really, was open to being censored for information that's inconvenient to technology, which is incredible. Again, people can have a blanket view that, um, well. It, it, if I wouldn't be allowed to use it if it wasn't safe. Hmm. Uh, and it's only when you start scratching away at the surface and you actually start looking at some of these potholes that you, you, you get a bit worried. I guess the main thing is that people should be more aware of the EMF fields they are being ex- could be exposed to um, mm-hmm. and take their own precautionary measure. That's really what it comes down to and not just accept that everything is, is going to be all okay because someone else is checking it for you. I, I, I can give you one little example. I, you know, my son, um, when he was, he, a friend of his was um, quite sick, having colds and flus and stuff. And he went around to his house. He had his uh, computer remote and right by the bed at night, he'd be sitting there going away doing this. And um, my son said to him, well, maybe you should just put those further away from the bed, you know, just mm. get away. And um, he did this, and he his health improved quite a bit. Another interesting case um, was one. It was that uh, lady who was doing a PhD through the CSIRO. Um, I, I knew her, and then met her one day after. You know, she was doing a PhD through the CSIRO, and I said, "You know, how's this study going?" She said, "It was." Uh, it's going slow because she's just fatigued and worn out all the time. The study, you know, there's so much study work needs to be done. And I just jokingly said, oh, maybe you're sleeping next to the meter box. And she said, oh, hmm, well, I am actually. So, so I said, look, I'll come around your house. We'll check it out. It's probably not a problem at all. So I went there and meter box wasn't a problem. But what was happening, she was being treated uh, by a specialist for something called adrenal exhaustion for about two years. And um, I noticed she had tr- a lot of trouble sleeping at night and she was sleeping close to the floor on a futon and she had, a, I think, sort of an iPod type thing, listening to music to try to just relax at night. Yep. And the I noticed the uh, little transformer was plugged in, in the wall and it was right by her pillow in her head at night. And fairly high fields. And I said, well, look, could be an issue. Uh, why don't you move the bed? So she did that, moved the bed away from that. 
And after two years, in, over a period of a few months, all her symptoms disappeared. And she wow. put that down to, you know, that's the one thing she did made a difference. After two years being treated by all sorts of things, trying to work out what her uh, adrenal exhaustion was coming from, it looked like moving away from those magnetic fields from that little transformer um, looked like that was the main issue. It it really seems from everything I've I've researched that that EMF um, is very laborious on the body. The, so even if you don't get a cancer, it's very it's it's a laborious activity. It's like your body is on the back foot, and it's constantly pushing an uphill battle to maintain the status quo. At best, that's the effect it has. You know, in terms of the least impact, that's the effect. And then obviously you go into cancers and other issues. But it does seem like from what you read and what you see and uh, that it is definitely there's there's something there that that emf fields in some capacity they're very laborious against you your, your cellular health yeah it sort of seems to be for some people it's immune system exposure it's just so frustrating that that's not being front and center of the research i mean you know obviously if like we know now with constant inflammation can then become a breeding ground for cancer so Mm. With this constant activity and and the immune system constantly on the back foot, you know that becomes a breeding ground for other problems. So we we just it's so frustrating that we're not looking, and I think a lot of those issues stem from comments that come, which again is is listed in this document of yours. I'm just where which I thought was quite bold. Yes. Precautionary approach isn't required. There's no reason to recommend a precautionary approach. How can anyone <laughs> in any field? say that there's no reason to recommend a precautionary approach to anything. What a, what a bold comment, a recklessly bold comment to make. Well, there was one international conference I went to, and there's another fellow who, um, I'm just trying to think of what he said, a similar sort of thing, saying that they don't recommend precautionary approaches because, it, you know, the precautionary approach in itself can be a health detriment. Which means if you take a, you know, if you take a precautionary approach, maybe saying, well, if you're going to use a mobile phone, use hands free, don't put it next to your head. That's sort of precautionary advice. Yeah. That can be a health detriment because it makes people worry. So, they, so they're you know, saying so, that worry is a health problem, yes. but that radiation isn't. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just find that really bold. I find it bold and I, I find it odd that so many can be comfortable doing it. That's maybe it's a bit naive of me to think like that. I don't know. I just think they could go about it a lot better. They could, they could just say, look, we're, we're not sure. We'll never be sure. Lean on the side of caution, use a headset, hmm. minimize your time. Don't sleep with the thing. Well, the main thing I think what has been the main game is controlling, setting up supposedly international organizations and getting them to be the arbiter of truth. And I find so many times, um, well, in Australia, local governments and whatever, is that they just defer to, um, well, look, the International Commission Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection connected with the WHO. Goodness gracious, who are we to believe? They say it's not a problem. Mm, yeah, yeah. And so it's very convenient. You can justify that to yourself. Well, look, they don't say there's a problem. It's oh, convenient. Don't thank you very much for okay. your time and your insight. I, I appreciate um, all the information and you know i'll certainly put those links there so people can find that information as well so you know, people that want to go deeper with it but no thanks very much i really appreciate you jumping on and sharing all of that oh i enjoyed it so well thank you very much thanks very much for listening to the end of the show i do certainly appreciate it if you are interested in looking a bit deeper i will have a page set up on the bumping into website you can head to bumpingintocom Dot au. Once there, find the episode page. There'll be a bunch of links and other information that can take you to some of Don's work and reports, uh, along with a couple of other things. You can also check out past episodes and particularly the ones that also relate to EMF, 5G, Wi-Fi, and information around how the safety standards and guidelines have been set. If there is someone else that you think would enjoy the show, please do hit the share button. And if you do get an opportunity, I would be very grateful for a five-star review. That is the only way that the show will grow and reach a bigger audience.
As always, the website's there if you want to listen to past episodes on any other topic and I will be doing my best to bring you some more episodes in the next coming weeks. Thanks very much for stopping.